Hello, greetings. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And that's eternal life. This is going to be part nine of the Abomination of Desolation series. Uh, we're going to go get your King James Bible. We're going to go to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel, one of the toughest books in the Bible, in my opinion. Uh, there's more things I do not understand with the book of Daniel than things I do understand. Uh, the 70 weeks thing, I don't know. You know, I've never been understood it that well. And I've never read anybody's writings that I feel do understand it well. I just know that uh, dispensational theology is a crock of horse manure. And I'm being very kind because to dispense something means to give something. And when it was talking about Moses, it was talking about he was dispensed or given the law. Whereas Paul, when he was given a dispensation or dispensed, he was given the grace of Christ. So, you know, the word appears, dispensation appears four times in the Bible. And then they write entire books on the seven dispensations of God, which they tell you is a period of time, which, yeah, you know, how can you give somebody a period of time? I mean, I, I don't know. I just don't get it. But then again, these people are the ones that think that the Antichrists in the Middle East are God's chosen people. And if you want to call um, the Antichrist God's chosen people, of which there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, well, that's up to you. All right. But... I digress. Uh, and what do I know? I'm just some guy that doesn't watch TV very much, spends his time doing Bible studies. Uh, so, you know, what do I know? Now, I don't fly around in my $65 million Learjet, my mansion on the beach, begging for tithes. So, you know, what can I tell you? I'm just a volunteer. And uh, like I said, the difference between a volunteer and a professional is that a professional gets paid for what he does. And uh, nobody's paying me to do these Bible studies. So that makes me a volunteer. And like I said many times, just remember, you get what you pay for in this life. So, Daniel chapter 11. And I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, now the Medes were, I guess, uh, neighbors or part of the Persian Empire. Persia today, the modern Persian people, would be the Iranians. They were the ones that allowed Judah to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the city and the temple. And they allowed Judah to take all the furniture and gold back to the temple that belonged to for the Lord's service. And of course, today, we want to repay them by uh, starting a war with them. Now, this is June 23rd, 2019. Uh, there's going to probably end up being a war in Iran. And when that happens, the last, uh, the last Islamic army that could challenge the Israelis in building the temple will be destroyed. And I believe that's why we're having all these wars in the Middle East. But that's just, you know, my opinion. All right. And I, also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Now remember, people, God raised up the Babylonian Empire, and now he cast them down and brought and raised up uh, the Medes and the Persians. Verse 2. And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, 
There shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all, and by his strength through his riches he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. Now we're talking about Greece. Ever see the movie, the, uh, what is it, the 600 or the 300, uh, the Spartans, their last, their stand at Thermopylae under, uh, uh, what was his name, the king of Sparta? That's right, Leonidas. And uh, it was Xerxes, the uh, king of Persia, that went up against uh, the Greeks. So some people think that this is referring to Xerxes, X-E-R-X-E-S, because he, uh, he was the Persian king that went up against Greece, Grecia. So keep that in mind. Verse 3, And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, in other words, not his children, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. Now, there was a guy named Alexander. History records him as Alexander the Great. I don't considering him so great, but that's what they call him. He was from Macedonia. He spoke Greek. And he conquered from parts of India all through the Middle East, Egypt. He conquered the state, um, the, um, the land in the area of Israel. I mean, he can't, conquered most of the Mediterranean. And it wasn't until the Roman Empire that came until they conquered uh, the Greeks. And the Romans adopted a lot of the Greek culture. Now, Alexander, when he conquered uh, Egypt, he founded a city called Alexandria. Perhaps you've heard of Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, memory serves me correctly, it was a port city. But one thing they did have is they supposedly had the largest library in the world. And of course, the Romans came in and destroyed it. They burned it. Some people say the Romans were great builders. Others say the Romans were great destroyers. Why in the world would you destroy the, the largest library in the world? I, I can't figure that one out. But the thing is about Alexander, he conquered the, uh, the land that was known as Israel and Judah. Now, the thing is, by the time of Jesus, Greek was the common language of commerce. I mean, let's face it. You know, when you're conquered, you learn the language of the conquerors. If you you know, they're going to make you learn their language. You're going to learn it. That's just the way it is. But then the Romans came along and conquered Greece. And perhaps you've heard of the Eastern Byzantine Empire. Um, you know, this is all history. So, Alexander died when he was about 33 or 34, prime of life. So his four generals divided up his kingdom. Now, let's go back to reading Daniel 11. And personally, I think that this is what it's talking about. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others beside those. See, Alexander's four generals divided up his kingdom, the four winds of heaven, you could say. And that's, that's, that's how I look at it. Verse 5, And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes 
and he shall be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And in the end of years, they shall join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the, of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up and they that brought her and he that begat her and he that strengthened her in these times. But out of a branch of her roots, shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail, and shall also carry captives into Egypt, their gods, with their princes and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land. But his sons shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. And the king of the south shall be moved with C-H-O-L-E-R, Kohler, and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north, and he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. For the king of the north shall return, and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army, and with much riches. Now that's a thing. The... Uh, the generals of and the descendants of Alexander, who split up his kingdom, fought each other. That's usually how it works out. They're not happy with what they already have. You know, they want they always want more. That's the problem. Verse 14. And in those days there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision of but they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his will and none shall stand before him and he shall stand in the glorious land which by his hand shall be consumed. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither be for him. After this shall he turn his face unto the isles and shall take many. Um, Greece is full of little islands. And then you've got... Sicily, and you, you got a bunch of little islands in the uh, Mediterranean. So I don't know which Pacific islands they're talking about here, but, you know, just know that. After this, he shall turn his face unto the isles and shall take many. But a prince for his own behalf shall cause a reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, reproach he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, but within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor, nor in battle. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall be strong with a small people. Now, I wonder, is that talking about 
um, something that happened back in those days, but does it foreshadow something set into the future? I mean, I don't know. And because how can you become strong with a small people? Are they talking about the tribe? You know, when they talk about the 1% that rules the world, they're talking about the tribe. My opinion. Verse 24. He shall enter peaceably, even unto the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches, yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army, and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. And both these kings' heart, hearts, and both these kings' hearts, shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, and yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. At the time appointed he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. Oh, a note real quick. When Alexander the Great, a Macedonian Greek, conquered the known world and compelled them to learn the language of Greek, just remember something. The New Testament was written in Greek. I mean, it was just, it was the common language. I mean, much like English today, do you know that English is the most known second language in the world? Many, many countries in uh, Europe speak English as a second language. And I'm not talking about uh, England. I'm talking about in Germany. You want to graduate from high school? You got to take English. They, they know English. Uh, Denmark. They know English. Uh, all kinds of countries in uh, Asia learn English. Matter of fact, if you're in English, uh, if you've got a bachelor's degree uh, in English, and um, you can go anywhere in the world and get a job teaching English and make a decent make a decent living. Matter of fact, there's um, people with uh, if you've got a master's degree in English with a English as a second language certification, you can make $60,000 a year in all kinds of third world countries. They pay very, very well. Matter of fact, some of those third world countries will pay you as an English teacher uh, just as well as the United States will. Because the private schools, I mean, people pay a lot of money to learn English. But that's, you know, Greek was the language spoken commonly in the Middle East, um, thanks to Alexander. So when the New Testament was written, it was written in Greek, not Hebrew. Hebrew was a dying language even back then. And if you looked at my studies where Christ was on the cross and he said, Eli, Eli, lama, lama sabachthani, um, you know, which is interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Jews thought he was say, calling for Elijah. They didn't even understand what Christ was saying. You know, and then these liars will tell you the New Testament was written in Greek or uh, Hebrew and then mistranslated into Greek. So you can't trust the New Testament because it, it was mistranslated. That's what they will tell you. Liars. That's what they are. Liars. Now, New Testament was written in Greek. And let me tell you something, people. The Greek church that spread the gospel to the eastern 
uh, Europe, they are the most, they were, that, that church has suffered persecution more than any other church in the history, except for perhaps the, um, the Russian church under uh, the communists of about less than 100 years ago. So, all right, let's go back to Daniel 11. Enough of my rants. Uh, 11, Daniel 11, verse 30. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be uh, grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. Now, who forsook the holy covenant? Israel and Judah, right? Verse 31. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Now, for what I understand, uh, the Greeks rededicated the temple to, I think it was Zeus or whatever, and they sacrificed a pig. You know, that's probably, this was future. This was future back when this was written. But uh, some people will say, well, you know, this was the Romans. I think it was the Greeks. I don't know. One day we'll be able to ask the Lord and we'll know all things. But right now uh, we're kind of guessing. Verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. Uh, you could read about the Hellenization of the Jews. Uh, the Jews were complaining about the Greek uh, influence upon Judah. And I don't know. They considered it a corruption. All right, so let's see. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity, and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be holpen with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, and to purge, and to make them white, and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Now it says, when it talks about making them white, uh, doesn't it talk about in Revelation that the church would be given uh, white garments washed in the blood? Oh, yeah. I think that's what it's talking about there is uh, white wedding garments. Verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Now, I think this is... Uh, this is, I think this is tied into Revelation, verse 35, because it says, Even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed, and the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that is determined, shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. Now, I believe he's going to be a Jew. Uh, we'll find out. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. Some people think he's going to be a sodomite, but we'll see. Neither shall, regard, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all.
All right, let's take a look at uh, 2 Thessalonians. Thessalonica was a city in Greece, and Paul wrote this apostle. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. I think this ties into what we're reading. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, what day? The second coming. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Is that falling away come? Oh, yeah. We got sodomite marriages, legalized abortion, uh, prayer and Bible reading in public schools where it was legal for over 200 and something years is now banned. Oh, yeah. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Perdition means to fall. Verse 4. All right. That man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. I think that is tied right into what we just read, or, or we're going to read, right? Verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know that withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Uh, Bob note real quick. Some people say that the Holy Spirit is going to be take is the restrainer and is going to be taken out of the way. I don't think so. Because without the Holy Spirit, nobody could come to the Christ and come to the Lord. Nobody. Without the, the urging of the Holy Spirit, impossible. And they say that God's going to take the Holy Spirit away from the earth as the restrainer. I don't think so. I think Michael is the restrainer. And I think God the Father will tell Michael to stand aside and let his plan go through. But that's just my opinion. And if you got a different opinion, hey, that's all right. All right. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, people. People, this guy is going to have supernatural power, miracles. Verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. All right. Uh, let's see. Daniel 11, verse 37. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any guard, any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. The force uh, Star Wars, any Star Wars, anybody? The Force? I don't know. 
But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. And at the time of the end, and at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall pa have power over the treasury, treasuries of Oh, I'm sorry, over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now what's interesting about Bible prophecy is sometimes there is a fulfillment, a partial fulfillment at a certain time period, but then it's like a foreshadow of what's coming in the future where there's an ultimate fulfillment. And that's kind of how I see it. I don't know. You know, I could be wrong uh, I'm, you know, I don't claim to be a prophet or have any, uh, you know, monopoly on truth. That's for sure. I've learned from many different people some things and, uh, and, uh, all glory to God, right? So I don't know. We're going to, you know, when things start playing out, it's going to be clear to those who study the book, the scriptures. It's going to be, you know, things, things are going to go according to God's will. He's going to allow these things to happen. And sadly, the denominational or demon nominational church world, that uh, the ones that trust their preachers more than they trust the scriptures, many of them are going to be deceived. Many of them. Especially when they find out that uh, the pre-trib rapture never happens and they're going to have to make a choice. Either deny Christ to save their lives or die for the faith. And Christ warned us that if you uh, denied him before men, that he would deny you before the Father and his angels. So people are going to have to make a choice. And, uh, you know, maybe one day the mark of the beast, I don't know. Uh, and there's churches today that teach that believers can take the mark of the beast because of eternal security and once saved, always saved. Well, you know, even though you took the mark of the beast, you're, you're going to go to heaven because, you know, eternal security uh, you know, you said a sinner's prayer and that's it. You know, God can't, can't, God can't go back on his word. That's what they tell you. But Christ warned, John warned that those that take the mark of the beast and worship him are going to be cast in, into the lake of fire. Things are going to get real soon, people. Noahide laws, N-O-A-H-I-D-E. Those things are going to be used to put many people who proclaim faith in Christ to death. So it's going to be real, people. All right, well, I'm, this is Chaplain Bob. 
Light of the World Ministries. And uh, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And that's Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen.